Um, uh, we're talking about Wendy's book, Why I Read, the one that's going to be for sale in the lobby later. Uh, and my first question is about the book itself. Um, I would say on every page there are intelligent, insightful observations, and the breadth of your reading is absolutely awe-inspiring. But I actually, and I mentioned this to you once at lunch, I don't quite get the book. So, uh, and maybe that makes me ideal to ask you these questions, because I'm, I'm a little puzzled. Um, and my first question, in a way, is for whom is it intended? Because I would guess anyone who buys it and reads it is already a reader. You're not going to persuade non-readers to read. So what, what, what are you trying to convey and to whom? Hmm. Okay, good. And uh, I've never been asked that question before, and so I am going to have to think as I go along. But, and it may take me a little while to get to the point, but I will get there eventually. Um, I thought of writing this book while I was writing the book that came out before it, which was a biography of Shostakovich as seen through his 15 quartets. And as you know, because you're a music person, I am not really a music person, and it was a very, very hard book for me to write. I, I really had to make a huge effort to understand things, to take in information, not to say stupid things in the book. The whole thing was very stressful. So while I was writing that book, I told myself that the next book I wrote would be about literature, the thing I know most about, that I've thought about for my whole life, that is kind of second nature to me. And in its original form in my mind, it was a young person's guide to literature, like Shaw's Young Person's Guide to Socialism or something like that, you know, not, not a, but not a teaching book, but a kind of chatty book that was addressed to people that I would pass along all my great acquired knowledge over all these decades of reading. Well, when it came time to write the book, I didn't really particularly care to address young people only. And I thought, okay, so it's not going to be that, but it is going to still be a sort of conversational book about books that I care about. And not just high art books, but science fiction and mysteries, which I read for fun. And, uh, and not just books that are by old dead people, although I love books by old dead people, but uh, also some that are contemporary and some by people I know, but mostly by people I don't, some in translation, some not. I just thought it would have all those things in it. But I did conceive of it from the beginning as a book. In other words, these are not separate chapters that were written as essays and published in various other places and then brought together in a book. I thought of it from the very beginning as a book that would have certain topics. And when I started the book, the topics in my mind were character and plot, which in, ended up coming together into one chapter, character and plot. Um, authority was there from the beginning, grandeur and intimacy. These are all chapter titles. Novelty, it had a different name in my mind, but ha that was all there from the beginning. The book as physical object, which is an appendix to, the book, to this book, that was there from the beginning. The idea of leafing through the pages of a book, I wanted to have that. Now, I also knew from the beginning that it was not going to be a complete book. It was not going to tell you everything that needed to be known about reading. And it was not going to be, in that sense, why we read or why one reads. It was not going to be a theoretical book that attempted to answer a question, either a psychological or a sociological question about the human being reading a book. A, because I'm not a, a psychologist or sociologist, I'm just a reader. And B, because you cannot be complete. I mean, if you, that way madness lies, or Kasabin in Middlemarch. You know, you write a book that's never going to get finished and no one can ever read. So, so the incompletion was always a part of it. And part of what is meant to complete the book is the reader. In other words, it is meant to feel like a conversation, which may be why you're sensing absences or, you know, holes or something. Uh, it, it's meant to be something that the reader brings his or her own serious objections to, agreements, throwing it on the floor when they get mad, picking it up and reading it again when they like it, you know, all that kind of thing. And that is supposed to be part of the feeling of the book. So it's not, uh, it's not a, a school lesson. It's not a, a theoretical instruction. It's just a conversation. Only I get to do all the talking for the duration. <laughs> I'm comfortable with that. Uh, <laughs> but implicit in it, I think, or, or maybe I'm wrong, it's, I should put this in the form of a question, is implicit in this the notion of a hierarchy of response, that some responses are more valid or more interesting than others, that people who also read will nevertheless 
defer to you or, I mean? Uh, if that's there, it's not on purpose. That's just my manner, you know? I mean, I, <laughs> I like authority in the sentences I read and I probably emit authority in the sentences I write. I just can't help it. It's the way I am. Mm -hmm. So I'm not meaning to say my responses are better than yours. I don't have any access to your responses. Again, that's why it's called why I read. I only know why I read. So that's what the book is about. My assumption, not only in this book, but in every book I write and in the Three Penny Review is that I'm not a unique individual in the world. That is, if I feel this way about things, probably there are a lot of other people that do too. Not identically, we're not cookie cutters, but there's gonna be an overlap. So my assumption is if I wear my opinions and my personality and my preferences on, uh, on the surface, they will match up with a number of other people's. Not millions of other people, because I'm not that kind of writer, but enough other people to make a difference. So it's in a sense to provoke a conversation within each reader? Would you say that in the, in the sense that's what you're aiming for? I think that's partly what I'm aiming for, but I'm also aiming to transmit opinions that I believe are true, but they are only a belief. In other words, there's no, that's the great thing about literature. There's nobody there to say, we're, I mean, we are not in high school anymore, and there is no teacher to tell you, no, that's wrong. You cannot have that opinion, and that is a terrible paper, and blah, blah, blah. It, it, that, the great thing about being a grown-up out there in the world with literature is, it is all a matter of opinion. So of course I prefer my own opinions and I think they're, they're closer to the truth, but it's all a matter of belief and approach to the truth. There is but no proof. Not only closer to the truth, presumably, but provocative, so that they're, they're worth confronting or contending. Again, that's unintentional. That is, again, that's a <laughs> temperament and personality mm -hmm. thing, as you must well know. <laughs> um, I, when I say I can't stand James Joyce's Ulysses, I'm not actually trying to be provocative. I'm trying to say something I've been dying to say for 30 years, you know? And, and everybody's always hushing me up about it. So finally I got to say it in this book. There were other more, more provocative statements that were in the book before it reached print, but my editor, who's a, a wonderful woman named Eileen Smith, and who had edited at least one previous book of mine, kept saying to me, do we have to have all these negative things? She said, people aren't really going to be reading the book to see what you don't like. They want to hear what you do like. So some of the don't likes ended up on the cutting room floor. Share a few with us. <laughs> we, we won't tell anybody else. Well, the one that I thought that she had the most valid claim to eliminate was a book that people probably don't even read anymore, which was, uh, was her name Josephine Hart, the author of Damage? The one that was married to the right. Sachi guy. Yeah. And when I was giving examples of good openings and bad openings to books, I gave the example of Damage as a book whose opening paragraph acted really portentous, and I'm going to be telling you something important, and these are serious issues I'm grappling with in this important novel. And it, the novel is a piece of crap, I think. And so, <laughs> and I was trying to say that, these, that this kind of portentousness you need to be aware of that a, a great novel like uh, I, the uh, one I gave was uh, J.M. Coetzee's Elizabeth Costello starts tentatively and with little sentences that don't have big words and are just guessing at what's true. And this Josephine Hart novel asserts itself as something important. So my editor said, nobody reads that book anyway. Nobody wants to hear you on it. It was gone. <laughs> okay. All right, I, wanna, I want to... Um ask you about The Space Between, which is the name of one of the chapters. And again, and I, I'm willing to plead stupidity or ignorance, but I didn't quite get what you were getting at. Um, I, the, the, the meaning I think that you invoked most was the space between the reader and the writer. And to what extent, well, first of all, I hope you'll expatiate upon that, but, but to what extent is that different from the space between any two people having a conversation. I mean, you're always trying to judge the reliability or the judgment or, or the intelligence or whatever of anyone you're talking to. And it's always, you're always interrogating that silently to yourself while you're talking to somebody. Is it different when you're reading and it's an author? 
I see now the disadvantage of having said that they could have Eric as my interlocutor, which is he asks hard questions, you know. <laughs> Usually it's just a little softball toss, but anyway, okay, now I have to think. Oh, and, um, what did, and what did you have for breakfast? I forgot yeah. to have. And, and do you sleep naked? That yeah. was my next question. Um, first, I have to explain how this chapter arose. It was not in the original list of chapters I was going to write, the space between. The idea for it was always in the back of my mind, and it had many different meanings. That is very much the space between the reader and the writer, and I'll get to the answer about other human beings later. Also the space between the author and his main character, or the author and her narrator. In other words, that space that's already there, that distance in literature. The space that is the left out words in poetry, so poetry was always going to be part of this book, and, and the kind of poetry I like often makes leaps. It doesn't give you every word in the sentence, but gives you a suggestion of things, and you have to make the jump yourself. Um, also in that chapter, and in the back of my mind, was the space between, this is sound, will sound bizarre and obscure, but one of my favorite books is David Copperfield, Dickens's David Copperfield, and in it, there's a character uh, called Mr. Dick, who is sane on every subject except King Charles's head. King Charles of England who had his head chopped off, giving rise to Cromwell. So not Hilary Mantel's Cromwell, but the other Cromwell. <laughs> anyway, so the great thing about Mr. Dick as an exemplar is that he, he's just obsessed with this. And he's, he'll write and write other things, and then suddenly King Charles's head will come entering into his prose. He can't get rid of it. And for me, that beheadedness, that head being chopped off, somehow connected for me with all the other spaces between. The space between the living and the dead is another that's very important in that chapter. Now that chapter was originally mushed in with character and plot. There were two separate chapters and they both had these space between things going on in them. And one of my readers, a guy named Thomas Wong, who is an investment banker, but he reads a lot for fun. He read this book before it was published and he said, I really don't get what's happening here, here, and here. You know, I follow you here, as you just said, but not there. So I took everything he didn't get and I put it in the space between chapter and I tried to make that be about the, these issues that are very complicated and the breaks and the things that we don't know uh, and I, have to leap over. I have to say, King Charles's head and the difference between, a, the distance between a reader and a writer don't seem to me to be, other than the words, there's space between, to have that much in common. Well, <laughs> the big thing, the big thing that is different between assessing the reliability of another human being that you're talking to and assessing your relationship with an author, if you're a reader, is that the author is quite likely to be dead. In other words, that's, that separation between the dead and the living, and even if, even if the author is still alive somewhere, they're dead to you. You don't, for the most part, know the person as a person when you're reading their book. And if you did know that person, that might interfere with the reliability that you're getting from the book. The, the author and the, and the person behind the book are slightly different, and especially so when they're dead. Meaning that the relationship that I create with Henry James, which is a very deep and important relationship in my life, I create on total uh, guesswork and belief and assumption and projection. There is no real Henry James coming back at me, telling me, yeah, you got me right, or no, you got me completely wrong. I'm, I'm the only one that can assess the extent to which I'm getting him right or wrong. And so I think that space between does have something to do with beheadedness, does have something to do with uh, not being alive or having been terminated in some way that doesn't allow us full access to what's going on inside the head. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, I want to talk about authority, which I think is, uh, it, as a writer, I feel it's a very important concept, and I, I, there's a chapter on it. Um, but again, I, I wasn't quite sure how you were defining it. And um, I mean, I have a definition which I, I can propose, but I, I'm curious to hear what you mean by authority, or how you recognize it when you see it. Okay, but first propose yours. Well, mine is, I think, it's more a writer's in a way than a reader's authority. It's if I feel he or she is in 
total technical command of what I'm being shown. I'll give a writer a lot of space to convince me if the first few sentences sound like the person knows what he's doing. And if, if the way in which information is doled out, the way exposition is doled out, is done deftly. I mean, then I think, all right, this writer has authority. I trust him or her. And I, he or she may lose me later, but at least I, I'm willing to give them 100 pages or so. Um, uh, for me, that kind of technical command is necessary but not sufficient. And, uh, and sometimes, yeah, it's always necessary. In other words, if I find terrible grammatical errors or you know, a, a really stupid factual error or something like that early on in a book, I'm likely to be very suspicious and not grant it my authority, but, or its authority. But, uh, but what I mean is more, as you say, you're thinking of it from a writer's viewpoint and I'm thinking more from a reader's viewpoint. It has to do with the extent to which I feel that an actual real world is being created before my very eyes by this person and, and she knows what she's talking about and what she's talking about is important. All those things are true. And so it's there quite often in the earliest sentences of a book and beginnings are very important and uh, and I say this not only as a reader, but as an editor. So in the chapter, I give examples of stories that have come into the Three Penny Review that I liked or didn't like. That makes it sound sort of dumb, like it's just a gut reaction, but it is kind of a gut reaction because I have trained myself over the years to hear authority in these opening sentences and I right away have a sense that I'm being carried by somebody who knows what he or she is doing or not carried, drop dragged along, left to my own devices. So it's quite important to me in work that I don't know that's not by a famous writer, but it's also important to me in work that I know is recognized by other people. And, and I count it as a very important factor in reading, and my touchstone of authority is the Russian novelists of the 19th century. And so they, there's quite a bit about them in the chapter on authority, and the reason I, I count them as so important is because for them it was a life or death matter what they were saying, whether it was true or not, whether they had the right to say it or not. They, they put themselves on the line to say the things that they did in their novels and they also, as in Tolstoy, were enormously technically proficient. They really, really knew what they were doing and even in English, even in the way it comes over to us now, and after more than 100 years, we still can hear that authority in their writing. So, I'm, again, I'm not a very theoretical person, so I know what I mean by authority more by touchstones and examples than I do by anything that I can explain as an overarching fact. But, uh, but I do give a lot of examples in the chapter, and it, and it kind of accumulates into a definition, I would say, rather than being something that can be said in a few sentences. Do you think... Ulysses has authority? Just curious. <laughs> uh, I mean, let me explain why I, why I object to it, and, and that exactly gets at the, at the issue about technical proficiency. There is no book of the 20th century more technically proficient than Ulysses. It's really a mastery of a million different forms. And that, in fact, I feel coming out of the pages at me. I feel James Joyce saying, Look how great a writer I am. I can imitate this form. I can imitate that form. I can do the demotic language of Dublin, and I can do uh, you know the Greeks passed down to the present. I can do all these. I can do newspapers. I can do advertising. I can do everything. I'm such a great writer, and I hear that I'm such a great writer, drowning out Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom and even Stephen Dedalus, who's supposed to be the main character. And I, the part of the reason I can hear that is because I've read. Joyce's earlier work. So, Portrait of the Artist, there, Stephen Dedalus is a real character and he matters to us. Dubliners even more so. Those characters are listened to by an author who's just feeling his way into them and allowing them to express a reality which is the Dublin of their time and the little horrible, tragic and funny things that happen to them in their lives. It, compared to that writer that Joyce was when he was younger, to me, Ulysses is a failure because it's all about showing off. And that is, for me, when technical proficiency 
overwhelms authority or undermines authority. What's that little smile about? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're the interviewee, so I, I, I withhold my opinion. <laughs> She's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, talk, talk about the role of historicity. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned this a number of times in the book, and I, I think it's a really interesting question because it's almost never overtly acknowledged, although I think we all just take it for granted, we don't read Jane Austen the way we would read Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, our expectations of how people talk, it's not as if Jane Austen is accurately reflecting how people talk in the 19th century. It's a stylized kind of dialogue which we just accept. Um, uh, people don't have sex in Charles Dickens. There are babies, people get married and they have babies, but there's no sex. Uh, in but that's not because it was the 19th century, because they have sex in Henry James. All right, well, in the end of the 19th century, it began to change. Um, in French novels of the 19th century, people go to the bathroom. In English novels of the 19th century, they don't. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, I mean, how you feel about that, whether you have any sort of observations about the ways in which we adapt our reading persona to the period in which uh, the book we're reading was written. I don't. I probably have fewer opinions about that than about anything else, uh, or than you do, uh, because I tend to adapt unconsciously when I'm reading these books. And so I'm listening for the author's voice speaking to me, and the characters coming to life, and the setting coming to life, and that can happen. I mean, I have not been all the places that people are writing about in the 21st century. So I, I might read a novel set in India in the 21st century, and to me that's as different and inaccessible, and I have to kind of suspend disbelief as you know, reading Cervantes about uh, 17th century Spain. I'm having to make a leap no matter what if I have not lived through the life that's being described in the book. So it's not so hard to make a leap in time. <laughs> you tried to tell us something. <laughs> um, and there are certain books that are written in such a cranky, old-fashioned manner, like, um, I don't know, Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett is one I've never made it through. Or there, you know, there, are, there are some books that I feel like, God, they're just leaden because they are so of their time. But if I love a book and if I mention it in Why I Read, I pretty much have managed to zoom through it with pleasure no matter when it was written. Well, of course, I wasn't suggesting it wouldn't provide pleasure, but in, in some ways, sometimes the eccentricities or the alien qualities are precisely what we cherish. I, I, I'm just wondering if the extent to which it actually impinges on your consciousness when you're reading something. Very like little. I mean, in Jane Austen, for instance, I think of her as the total master of the of the creepy, irritating person. That is her specialty. And that person is irritating in exactly the way somebody in my real life could be irritating. I mean, she has got it, really. She, and she knows how to give me that feeling exactly as in real life. So I don't, I don't really see the distance. I know it's there. I, I have heard people say there's a difference between early James and late James style. I grant this is true because other people have pointed it out to me. I don't feel it myself. I, I you know, lower myself into the novel and then there I am. I'm reading along and I'm not noticing. Okay, we'll do about 10 more minutes of this and then I want to open it up yeah. for all of you. Oh yeah, questions. so start Here. thinking of questions, yeah. please. Yeah. Hurry. Um, you quote D.H. Lawrence as saying, trust the tale, not the teller. And uh, um, I'm wondering what happens when the teller, when, when the weaknesses in the teller's character are actually encoded in the tale. Can and you give an good. example? Well, an example would be D.H. Lawrence, the anti-Semitism, uh, or Benito Sereno, the racism, and we could go on. Um, to what extent does, does that influence how you read a book and trusting the tale rather than the teller? Okay, so I can't think of an example in a D.H. Lawrence novel of anti-Semitism. Well, Women in Love. 
I didn't, I haven't reread it recently. Benito Serino, I would argue that the racism there is the racism of uh, the 19th century being criticized. In other words, not criticized necessarily by a figure you can point to in the story or novella or whatever you want to call that Melville thing called Benito Serino, but, uh, but the story would not have the impact it does, a slave rebellion on a ship, if, if we did not know what we know about history and what was happening in the 19th century to black people being transported on ships. So there, I don't have any problem with Melville. And let me give an example from D.H. Lawrence. Much more likely than his anti-Semitism, which very few people have complained about, is his feeling about women. So... I was going to get... Yeah. yeah. So in <laughs> Sons and Lovers, there's this character, Miriam, who, he, who the main character, who's based on D.H. Lawrence, sort of falls in love with, but sort of not. And Miriam is always trying to, Lawrence would say, grab his soul, you know, kind of reach into him and get him in a way that he doesn't want to be gotten. And the passages of their encounter with each other are so intense that you don't feel that Miriam is the only problem. That is, it's a, pro it's a problem between them. It's his desire to withdraw or his confusion about he, what he wants as much as it is her neediness and her pulling toward him. And that's where Lawrence exemplifies his own statement. That is, the novel is smarter than the man, D.H. Lawrence, that told you what he thought about men's and women's relations. Again, from the same novel, Sons and Lovers, there's a character who is the father, the, the son is named Paul Morell, the father, what is, Walter Morell, and, um, and Walter is a coal miner, and he's a rough man, and he is not the person who allowed Paul to become the brilliant, creative, soon to be the writer D.H. Lawrence kind of person that we see in the novel. Walter just kind of doesn't understand his son, and he's like a, this brute figure plunked down in the landscape, and the mother gives everything to Paul. Okay, after you get about 30 or 40 or 50 pages of this, of Walter being the really obdurate figure at the table having, you know, coming out of the mines and everybody sensitive around him, you start feeling like the narrator is ganging up against Walter. And this happens to me more and more as I reread this book. You start siding with Walter, not completely. Again, it's like Paul and Miriam. You don't take one side or the other, but you see Walter's point because the book is pushing and pushing at him and, and something in you comes out to defend him. And that's what a great novelist can do. A great novelist gets you involved on a level that the narrator is not telling you to get involved in. So that's kind of how I think it works. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I, I want to talk about, I want you to talk about the concept of truth, because it's, it's an interesting concept in fiction, which by definition is a lie. And yet we both know, I think, from our own separate points of view, that truth is crucial to good or great art. So I was wondering how you would define it or how you would locate it uh, in a made up piece of work. Yeah, well, I guess first of all I would say it, it appears in a different form in every single work of literature. In other words, there is no formula for it. This is what it means for a novel to be true. This is what it means for a poem to be true. Even essays, of course, are selective and have a viewpoint and so they're only true to the extent they can persuade you. And, and you can see how truth is related to the authority in the sense we were talking about it. But I guess I would say um, it has something to do with the seriousness with which the author takes her subject or his subject and, and that author's faith in the in his ability to transmit it to you, the reader. So all of these, this whole, there's a relationship between the author and reality, very important to me, and even important in science fiction. See, it can't just be made up and have nothing to do with the way real human beings act. Isaac Asimov's robots are incredibly compelling because they reflect something about the way human beings act with other animate and inanimate objects. And, and then, so not only the relationship with reality, but the relationship with you and, and how you are presumed to get reality and 
not lying to you in that sense, telling you things that you maybe already know on some level but haven't formulated yet completely. So let me give an example of a book that I think is a pack of lies that everybody else seems to like, and that is this My Struggle by, I think he calls himself Nausgaard, but I call him Knausgaard just to mispronounce him on purpose. I really hate that guy, I, and I hate everything he writes. And I would say, you know, as, uh, as Mary McCarthy did of Lillian Hellman, everything he writes is a lie, including and and the. <laughs> because he thinks he knows so much, and he's trotting out all this stuff about what, you know, how brilliant he is and what insights he has and how his boring little life is so filled with event that you need to listen to. And it's, it's as if he doesn't grant you, the reader, any separate intelligence, any relationship to reality, any knowledge of your own. It's just he's leading you along. He's showing you what needs to be known because he's Mr. Brilliant. Anyway, that probably is enough of my opinion. We should hear from the audience. <laughs> All right, before we go to the audience, I have one other question uh, because it relates to the two of us on this stage, which is whether you think there's a difference in the way a critic reads and a writer reads. Um, I think there's probably a difference between the way you and I read because you are very interested in technical angles and figuring out how somebody has accomplished something and figuring out how to do your own novels. I would say I don't, I don't think of myself as reading like a critic. That is, I am a critic, it's part of my personality, but I don't read with a pen in my hand. I don't ever write in the margins of a book. I don't say too true or, you know, <laughs> tut tut or yuck or any of those things that <laughs> critics are supposed to write in the margins of books. I, I do read very much the way I read as a child, sinking into the book and becoming relatively unconscious of myself and just immersing. And that's what I do over and over again. I don't do it with every book because some books require you to read in a different way. Poetry often requires you to read in a different way. To a certain extent, short stories do. But mostly I just want to lend myself to the book. And so I would say that I'm, I'm, I'm less of a critic when I'm reading than you are a novelist when you're reading. Hmm. Well, I find that I have a kind of split consciousness. I'm both entirely absorbed in the book and caring about what's happening to the characters and their fates. And part of me is saying, is this where the first act ends? Uh, why is this scene here? What, why are we given that piece of information? It's just those two things are going on on two separate tracks, but simultaneously. Hmm. If I have that second track, it's very subdued. I hardly can hear it. So in one sense, do you, or in that sense, do you not make up your mind about a book until you've finished it? Uh, no, I mean, I threw down Knausgaard after 100 pages, so uh, I don't grant a book till the end. They can make mistakes before the end, but it's true that you have to wait till you get to the end to see how you feel about it overall. On the other hand, I always, always keep in mind Randall Gerald's wonderful statement that a novel is a prose work of some length with something wrong with it. That is, to me, a book having a flaw does not mean it's not a masterpiece. Huckleberry Finn is one of the greatest novels ever written. The entire last third is totally problematic, not to say garbage. I mean, really, really a problem. And, and fondly as I remember that book, every time I think about it, when I reread it, I can't believe how much of, you know, how long that awful ending goes on. So, but it doesn't mean that Huckleberry Finn is not a great book. And really, you can do the same thing for any novel. Okay, I, let's... If anybody has some questions, please just raise a hand. Wendy, why don't you okay. recognize people? It's, it's Mm -hmm. I, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, could everyone hear the question? No. Okay, I'll repeat when someone asks. He wanted to know whether, in terms of this question authority, of authority, I had ever given an author a second chance. I mean, you can answer the question too, but... Uh, and Only James Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, there's an example that I actually gave in the book, in Why I Read, which is... Um, 
Oblomov by Goncharov, this 19th century novel, which I started reading when I was about 20, and it seemed to be about a man who would not get out of bed. And I read, I probably read at least 50, maybe 80 pages of it, and he still hadn't gotten out of bed. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I get it. You know, this Russian novelist is commenting on the dissolute Russian aristocracy. They're just so flaccid, they can't do anything, they can't act in any way, blah, blah, blah. Forget it, I'm not interested. Okay, fast forward three decades. I pick up Oblomov, which is for some reason on my shelf, I don't know why. I start reading it. I have more patience, because I'm older. Uh, and I think, well, this is a big, big fat book, maybe something's gonna happen. So I get past page 100, and he finally gets out of bed, finally. <laughs> And he falls in love with a young woman, and he, she falls in love with him, and then his best friend gets involved, and they have a sort of trio thing going on, and they all try and save Oblomov. And I won't give you the whole plot, because it really is important. It's important that you not know what's going on, and you're reading to find out, in part. And then it's important when the last events have happened, and there's sort of a retrospective look of, at, back at the characters at the end of the book, and it is a truly wonderful novel, and I just didn't have the patience for it when I was young. So that was a lesson to me, but not a lesson I'm capable of taking in very often. <laughs> Let's see, more questions? Yeah, back there. Okay, so the question was, how do I read and reread and do all those things and hold down a job at the same time? Uh, how I remember, I can't answer that, and it's getting worse. It just, with everybody, it gets worse. Sometimes I sit there and I can't remember the name of a main character. I lie there in bed and it makes me crazy, but we have Google now, so it's been solved. Um, so I set aside a lot of time in my life for reading. And of course, I read for my work because I edit a literary magazine, but I don't count that. Reading the manuscripts that come in, I just met this very nice Indian man in the green room and he said, you rejected a poem of mine three days ago. And I thought, oh my God, you know, it's a <laughs> that's the kind of reading I do, deciding do I want this poem or not uh, in my work hours. And then I do a lot of other things in the work hours. But my work hours end at four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Because I'm my own boss, nobody is telling me I have to stay until seven or eight or nine at night. And at that point, I sit in a chair in, in our Berkeley house, in the room we grandiosely call the library, and, uh, and I read whatever it is that I have set aside for myself to read. And it might be a mystery, and I might be in the middle of a mystery and it would take a day or two. It might be, right now, I, just before I came, I looked at what the books were that are sitting next to that chair, and it's, um, the Italian novel by Manzoni that's been translated as The Betrothed, it's called I Promessi Sposi in Italian. Some German friends just recommended it a few months ago. I'd never read it. It's supposed to be the greatest 19th century Italian novel. So I'm reading that, translated by the same guy that did Lampedusa's The Leopard. Underneath that is uh, a Saramago novel, uh, Death and the something or other, I can't remember what the other element is, that was given to me by Margaret Jalcosta because my friend Tom LeCur just based an opera on it and he used Margaret's translation, so she gave me that. Underneath that is a French novel by some writer, I don't know who he is, but I took it off the Three Penny Review, review copy shelves. And underneath that is a novel by Alejo Carpentier, the Spanish writer that I haven't read. So there, this is a whole stack of things I can get through, but I'm not gonna go from the Manzoni to these other translated novels. I'm gonna take a break and I'm gonna go to some mysteries or to, to an Irish, young Irish novelist. I just read uh, two days ago, Mary Costello. has written a new book called Academy Street that I thought was pretty terrific. Um, and I spend at least two hours, I would say, at the end of every day reading for fun. And on weekends I spend more because I mostly don't do three penny work on weekends. So I'm, I might have four or five hours to read on a weekend. And I read pretty quickly and I, and I don't do things rigorously. I don't go back and reread all of D.H. Lawrence. I don't even go back and reread all of Henry James because 
it's a treat, you know, and I want it to still be a treat. So I go back every five or 10 years and reread one Henry James novel, and then I reread another, uh, not, not doing the whole thing together. The, my principle is it, it should be pleasurable. This is not to improve myself, because I mean, I'm gonna get to my deathbed and what's the point of being 100% improved, you know? <laughs> All right, anyone way out there that I haven't seen raise their hand? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, no, I don't think <laughs> I don't think Eric typifies male explaining whatever that is. Uh, but uh, and or even male well, reading. Let me, let me may I? Yeah. No, no. I'm <laughs> <laughs> You can hear from each of us on this subject, but I think we are pretty much, I think he and I are in agreement that there is no such thing as male reading or female reading. I would agree with that. I mean, a reader is a reader, and one of the great things about reading is that you can become whoever you want to be in response to this fantastic world you've been allowed into, and you, you aren't who you were in real life. You aren't attached to the body you were attached to. You aren't attached to the country you were attached to. The age you were attached to, all those things can be left behind as you plunge into this fictional and, world. And if I may, I think every writer has a different, who has authority has a different kind of manifestation of authority. And I certainly don't think Jane Austen has less authority than Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think it's a male-female thing. And I, I think these thoughts about women and men writers lead everybody astray. So I'm... I, I'm not against writers getting money, everybody should get all the money they can, but I don't like this orange prize, now renamed Bailey's prize, that goes only to women writers. Just as I would resent a prize that was only given to male writers. I just think it's a, I think it's a bad idea to classify people by gender. Uh, Elizabeth Bishop said a wonderful thing once, she didn't want her poems to be in an anthology of women poets, because she didn't like things that were separated out like that. She liked parties that were a mixture of people all together, and she liked reading that was a mixture of all kinds of people. And I thought, you know, that is my motto <laughs> there in Elizabeth Bishop's statement. Yeah. Whenever I read your books, I always feel like I'm going up to a higher plane of culture, okay? Which is wonderful, it's a great thing. Um, you know, you write about Mark Morris, and you write about the coming of the theater, and seeing all this marvelous classical performance, particularly of Henry Berlin. I never read garbage. Okay. Even the even the science fiction and mysteries are good ones. Right. <laughs> <laughs> My question, is, and this is going to sound terribly snotty, and I don't mean it that way, but I feel like I'm in good company with all the snotties. How do you cope with the onslaught of kind of not great cultural stuff that's out there right now? Uh, no, I understand exactly what you mean because my son is always telling me that I live in a bubble, and he thinks it's amazing that I've been able to create this little. Uh, plexiglass shell around myself and not have reality intrude on me. Once, once he said, name one athlete who is not Tiger Woods. <laughs> and I said, how did you know to accept Tiger Woods? You know, that m amazed me that he knew me that well. But anyway, I, ha I just blot out huge portions of reality. And it goes, it goes with that habit of, you know, spending my day on the Three Penny Review and then sitting in my chair and reading for two or three hours. That is... I don't really feel the need to be connected to all the different kinds of information that are flowing around. I find it actually too distracting. I watch TV, I like TV. Not a lot of it, I mean there's a lot of garbage in TV, but I like, I like the part that's not garbage. And, 
I, and I don't object to mass culture in that sense. I just, I don't like being distracted by all the things the culture is obsessed by. And again, because I'm uh, pushy and over authoritative and all the things that have come out in the course of this conversation, it doesn't really bother me that I'm living in a little corner of reality and I'm not connecting with millions of people and I'm not on the bestseller list and all that. I mean, I just think that that's the way one can choose to live and it's not a worse way. In fact, it's easier, a lot easier. Yeah. Do you have a favorite mystery writer you would share with us? I have a number of them, but the one, the set that I love best, and I really feel this whenever I go back to them, is the Martin Beck Mysteries by Mai Shoal and Perewalu. They were written by this married couple in Sweden in the 60s, I think. And they were envisioned as a 10 volume set and there are 10 of them and they are terrific. And then Henning Menkel is the kind of inheritor of that. Um, but there are a lot of great, there's a new Irish mystery writer named Tana French who I really love. She's pretty great and I mean she's a really good novelist and her mysteries, each one takes a character who was peripheral in the previous one and makes it the center of the next one. So it's like the camera moves and you get a whole different story and a whole different angle on. And I've learned a lot about contemporary Ireland by reading her mysteries. Anyway, I, I could list thousands. <laughs> All right, I think we're almost probably ready come to, go. to the end so you can turn your cell phones back. One on more question. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, take one more and then I'll be out there signing books. So if you didn't get to ask your questions, just come out and ask it. Uh, that's I'm, the kind of. I'm, I can, I'm glad you picked a little one for the. Final <laughs> <laughs> I am totally unqualified, and I even found I was teaching freshmen in college uh, a decade or two ago, and I thought it was getting harder and harder to get them to read things that had long sentences like Norman Mailer or Charles Dickens. They just couldn't make it through. So I would say it's just a matter of giving children books early on that are age appropriate but great you know, starting with Goodnight Moon, but moving up to, uh, by the time they're in fifth grade. Um, when I was in fifth grade, I loved Catcher in the Rye and um, Lucky Jim. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe I was a year or two more advanced than a normal fifth grader would be, but you can give them real books, but that are, that have a kind of thing that they can sympathize with and identify. In that case, both those books have a rebellious character who doesn't like the society that he's living in and complains about it all the time in a rather funny way. So I think it's just a matter of finding the right books and giving it to them. And there are lots of more recent books that you would know about and I don't that can be done with. Sorry, I couldn't solve that problem though. <laughs> Thank you for coming.